Today, I have a very special treat for everyone. The famous Maya guy has produced a two-part introduction to Bifrost for complete beginners. Now, Bifrost is a node-based VFX system that's free and built into Maya already. It can produce some incredible animation and effects. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass you over to Phil for part one. Hello, I'm Phil, also known as Maya Guy on YouTube. I'm a 3D and visual effects artist using Maya and Bifrost. Um, I am part of the beta testing team for Bifrost and have been using it since its inception a few years ago. It's a super powerful uh, piece of kit that's running within Maya. You might not know about it. Um, so David has kindly asked me to do a basic fundamental uh, look into Bifrost. So I'm gonna try and keep it simple and yeah, let's get to it. So I've got two characters here that were passed to me by David and they're just uh, imported Alembic uh, cache files. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna open Bifrost. So we do this by just going to Windows, Bifrost Graph Editor. And if you haven't got it in that display, you can just go into Settings Preferences, Plugin Manager and find Bifrost in there. So this is Bifrost. Um, as you can see, it's uh, the, the description is that it's a visual programming framework for 3D graphics. Don't let that scare you too much. Um, we can dig down deep and and uh, you know do some really really technical stuff, but we can also use it from like an artist's perspective and create some very cool things that would be very difficult to do in Maya alone. So I'm just going to dock this down here these two guys I've got on display layers and I'm just going to switch those off for a second and move this out of the way okay so the first thing we do with any new graph is click create graph and we're presented with an input node and an output node so anything in between here uh, feeds out to Maya and we can also feed some information back into Maya if we want to keyframe something uh, we would tend to put it back into the input so what we can do is we get our um, one of our Alembic models and we can middle mouse drag it into the graph editor. And if I just left click and drag that into the output, we can see that the character um, appears. So I can just move that out of the way for a second and we can see that what we've got is uh, basically a representation of our um, other character uh, that is still live in Maya. And if we select the uh, actual live Alembic in Maya and move it around, we can see that the Bifrost Graph Editor version of this moves with it. So I'll just switch that off for now. Generally, we don't really want to be moving the uh, graph around too much, so we'll just put that translate back to zero. So in between the uh, input of our model to the output, we've got uh, a bunch of information. And I can look at the information that's contained in here by right-clicking anywhere along this line and add in what's known as a watch point. This is going to give us a bunch of information on this character. It's going to give us the uh, polygon count. It's going to tell us about the point normals and various other things. It's not something we're going to look at too much at the moment, but it's just something to note um, for the future. So we can right-click and click hide viewport. So what can we do? There's a multitude of things we could do. Um, Bifrost works by hitting the tab key on your keyboard um, and it opens up various menus and there's lots of menus within menus but generally within Bifrost we start to type in here um, and we can find certain nodes that we uh, want. So the first thing I'm going to do before I do any of that is to just add uh, a plane on the ground and I'm just going to scale that out to about yay big. That'll do. And I'm going to drag that plane into the graph as well. And I'm just gonna undo this. We can undo things by left clicking and pulling them out. Or we can hold down shift and alt and left click and we can cut, which breaks connections. So we're gonna use, we're gonna uh, instance our, um, our Alembic model over this area out here. So to do that, we just open up the tab and we just start kind of intuitively typing instance and we get quite a lot of um, different options come up. But we wanna come down to the one that says create instances, which kind of makes sense really. 
So within this node, we can see that it's going to accept some points and it's also going to accept instance geometries. Now, if you note, we can see that these two uh, nodules or inputs have got different shapes to them. Anything with a hat uh, like this is uh, looking to accept what's known as an array. So that's just like, you know, many different objects, many different values. Um, and because it's got these three dots, it means that you can accept multiple um, of those. So for now, though, we're just going to plug our character into the instance geometries because that's what we want it to be. And we've got our plane here, and we're going to use that as the points that we want to instance on. So every one of these vertices that we can see on the plane is where we're going to get an instance. So I'll just plug that into points. And we're going to plug instances into the output. You can put it underneath. Um, that's fine. So now we've got a bunch of instances um, on the plane here. And if we rewind and play, we can see that they're all doing the animation as expected. So the interesting thing with Biofrost is that it can display a, a lot of data in Maya, um, a, a lot more than you'd expect from Maya to display itself. Um, so what we'd like to do at the moment is to add more resolution to this plane without actually going in and adding more divisions to the geometry itself. And we do that by scattering. So if I hit the tab key again and start to type scatter, we can see that there's one here that says scatter points. And what we're going to do is we're going to take the points from the plane add them into the scatter node and then output those new points into the instance node. So let's just get rid of this and re-plug it into here, into scatter. If we look at the uh, scatter on its own uh, and just, you know, if we just plug that into the output on its own, we're not going to see much because um, this plane is, in, is, uh, is currently in the way. So if we just hide that for a second, control H, we can see all of these little points. And that is, these are the points that Scatter is creating. So within almost every node in Bifrost, we have a parameters section to the right, much like the attribute editor. So if you select something in the viewport, you'll see that it's got attributes. Bifrost does the same thing. Um, and we can see in here, we've got a mount. If I sort of, um, left click on this and pull it back to the left, we can see that we're decreasing the amount of points. And conversely, if I push it to the right, we can see that we're adding more points. And we could add lots and lots and lots of points. So if we leave that alone number first, which is advisable to start with, we're gonna um, undo this from here because we don't need to see them anymore. And we're now gonna use these points to scatter on, let's just unhide plane so let's just go uh, show last hidden and I'm just going to pull these points into here now we've got a lot more people um, they're facing a different direction but that's fine we can uh, sort that out in a minute um, and if we press play we can see that they're still running or walking no problem um, what we could do now though is that because Bifrost can handle a lot of data we can start to put in some larger numbers so if I put in something like a thousand so for every, um, we've got a thousand points and we've got a thousand characters. Um, and I can quite easily add another zero to this. Now we've got an awful lot of um, Alembics. And uh, what is actually crazy about this is that if I hit the play button, they're actually all walking. Um, and, you know, that's, 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 quite, that's quite a lot of instances. So um, I can rewind and I, I can still up these numbers um, if I want to. Obviously at some point things are gonna slow down. Um, we've got a little bit of lag in, in the viewport now. But if things are lagging too much, we can switch to preview mode of the instance itself to uh, bounding box. And then we can move around and carry on out in, in our scene uh, as we please. So I'll just put this back to preview geometry. And we'll just bring that number back down um, on the on the scatter node to something like 1500. And we can see we've got 1500 of our guys there. 
So the next thing we can do is, well, we can add another instance um, because we don't, you know, this array will accept more um, objects than one. So if we just go to the outliner, we'll bring in the jog model, drag that into the uh, editor, and we can now plug that also into instance geometries. And we can see that we've actually got two in there now and we've got a walk inversion and a jog inversion. As you can see, there, um, you know, some are walking and, and some are jogging. So that's cool. Um, but they're all quite uniform at the moment. They're all kind of the same height and they've got the same rotation. So we can start to uh, manipulate that a little bit as well. So we want to randomize some of that. So out at this end of the instance, we could start to put some randomization in. So if I just hit the tab key again and I start to uh, type rand, um, you can see we've got lots of options, but we could have randomize point rotation. That's gonna give us a node here. So we're gonna unplug this and plug it back in and then uh, plug that back in here. And now we can see that all of our uh, people are randomized in, in the way in which they're facing. Um, as you can see in Bifrost, everything works downstream. You know, we, we start at one end and we continue to move that data down and eventually out into the output. So that randomization might be too much, but we can uh, play with that here again. And we can start to, you know, make it a little bit less crazy. Just start to bring those numbers a little bit closer together. Um, and we just, you know, things could start to be a little bit more subtle in terms of uh, how they're randomized. Again, if we play it, they're still doing their thing, but everything's starting to look slightly less uniform now. So from randomized point rotation, we could also randomize the scale of these characters. So if I type in rand again, we can go down to randomized point scale. And again, because everything goes downstream, we'll just unplug that and plug that into here. And all of the information continues to carry on down the stream. And now we can see that we've got some characters that are really tall and some characters that are really small. Um, we can change these values. We can go from uh, min to max. So I could bring down some of the smallest ones or bring them up until they're you know just almost the size of the max. Obviously, we can bring down the max as well. And so now we've got some variation going on. We could go back to the scatter and we can say, do you know what, I like that. I'm gonna start to push those numbers up a bit. And now we've got 5,000 points of all of these guys in uh, various rotations. Um, and, you know, the scene moves around. The, the performance is perfect still. And we can rewind and play. And all of these people are, you know, doing their thing still. So let's bring that number down again. Let's bring it down to about 500. And have a look what we can do from here. So this kind of thing could work really well if you were building maybe a street scene or some kind of architectural fly through um, where maybe you had multiple um, surfaces like maybe a sidewalk um, so we could you know, grab this plane and, and scale it down to here. And if you see, you can see that as I'm scaling this, the people aren't scaling, they're just, um, they're just moving and they, they become more dense um, the more I scale that down. If they're overlapping too, too much, we can go into the scatter node and the scatter node has got a, a thing called culling, which means that we can cull any overlapping points based on a distance. I don't know if you saw that, but when I clicked on coal overlapping, we got like a little jump there. And that's just Biofrost trying to say, okay, anything within this radius, um, get rid of, and we can make that radius bigger so that we get less overlap of characters. Um, and obviously when they're all moving, then it's gonna make things a lot easier for us. So, we, you know, we don't get any intersection going on. So, What's great about this is it's like a non-destructive workflow, which means that it's very quick for me to go back in and swap these models out for other models, for vehicles, for primitives. I could just put a sphere into the scene, drag that into the viewport, add that 
to this and we can see we're going to get spheres also um, turning up. So from here we think, do you know what, actually we want another sidewalk on the other side of the road. So I'm just going to duplicate that and I'll just drag the plane in. And now we need to make some, um, uh, some decisions because we've got two objects and only one scatter node and it isn't going to take um, an array like the instance geometries down here. So what we would do in this instance is we could just uh, cut that off for a second. Now it's, it's a good workflow to pause the graph uh, while we are building out certain nodes just so that we don't get any slowdown. So to pause the graph we can hit um, control, the plus sign and the full stop or period if you're in America. Um, and that puts this red line all around it with this word that says paused which means we've paused the graph and we can start to mess around with everything in here and nothing's going to update here. Um, and everything's going to be quicker. Uh, you can also get to that, I believe, um, I think it's actually resume graph execution. Yeah, there we go. So we just click that edit and um, we can pause it again in here as well. Uh, pause graph execution. So what we need to do now is we need to combine these two objects within Bifrost. There's a couple of ways we can do it. Um, First thing we could do is we could type in merge and we could uh, get a merge geometry node and that would allow us to plug in um, some geometry but it won't accept two pieces of geometry. So what we have to do is build an array and it sounds complicated but it really isn't. So we're just gonna hit the tab key, start typing build and now we can see we've got uh, a node called build array and we just hit enter and we're going to put in our first plane to the top and our second plane to the bottom and it's basically just taking all of the information here all of the information here and storing it in one array um, and then we could plug that into merge geometry so it's merging all of that information and then we could take that merged and plug it into scatter and if we unpause we can see that now we've got our people on both sides of the street and we can again use the scatter node to uh, populate them any way that we want. So without getting too complicated we could take things a step further. We could get these guys moving um, uh, along a uh, translation axis. So let's just give ourselves a bit of room here. Now if I type in transform there's a node here called apply transform. And what we're really just gonna be doing is transforming the points that are coming out of scatter um, into the apply transform and back out to the instances, which kind of makes sense really. So if I just put that into apply transform and put this back into points, we can see that there are some attributes for apply transform and we've got X, Y, and Z. Um, and if I just start to um, middle uh, sorry left click inside of these, we can see that we are moving those transforms. Um, but how do we animate this? Well, we can, can animate this by feeding uh, some of this and uh, some of this information back out to the input and then animating it within Maya. Um, or we could just go a little step further and have it animate over time. So. Um, to do this, because we're dealing with um, a vector, which is um, a vector free, one, two, three, we need to firstly um, type in value. And just bear with me, this will all make sense as I get to it. And we're gonna plug the value into translate. So at the moment we've got a value node here, which is zero, and it's just what's known as a float number. But we can change the types of values uh, by clicking on this little button here. That's gonna open up this window. Um, if you've ever done any expressions in the Maya particle um, system, you might understand some of this. But quite simply, we're gonna to go to vector, and we're gonna click on three, and we're gonna click okay. Now that's going to give us um, the same three values that we had in Translate, X, Y, and Z. 
And if we open up this little drop down box, we can see the X, Y, and Z there. So now we want to add a time node. So if I just uh, press tab and type time, I can bring out a time node here. Um, and I can plug that into X and these people will move over time in X. However, we want to control that a little bit. We want to control this time a little bit. Um, and so we want to give ourselves another value to play with. So if I type in M-U-L-T, mult, multiply, we can bring up a multiply node and we're just going to plug our seconds into multiply and then we want to know what we're going to multiply it by so we'll just type in value and we can get a value node turn up and we can plug that in to the multiplication and then plug those into the x so now I can multiply my time by this value and that will give us a new value in x so let's say for now I'm just going to put a value of 6 into multiply and so if I rewind and play now, all of our people are going to be moving over time, however long your uh, timeline is, um, constantly at a value of 6. But we might think that looks a bit odd, so we could put it at 4. And um, yeah, all of, our, all of our people are walking. And it's probably a cheap crowd system. You could use this in your architectural visualizations in the background, have a bunch of characters doing this. And there are ways in which we can offset each character from each other. But I'm not going to go into that today because it's just a little bit more, um, a, little, a, little, a, a few more steps. Um, and I don't want to overcomplicate things for, um, for this. Class Creatives have offered my viewers a massive 25% off all their masterclass courses. All courses are taught by seasoned professionals who have worked for companies like Disney, Naughty Dog, Insomniac Games, Sony and more. Like this one which covers full character creation workflow from start to finish, utilising Substance Painter, ZBrush and Maya to bring your characters to the next level. The great thing about Class Creatives is the ability to learn at your own pace. So I'll leave the link in description, use my unique code to receive 25% discount off the pro subscription. Any small commission will be put back into building this channel. Thank you. So let's just tidy up our scene a little bit and have a look at what we've gone through here. So we've got our scatter node. We've got we've got our, um, we've got our two planes which are being scattered. So we've put them into an array. Uh, so all of their information has gone into an array. It's been merged. So we've just got um, one piece of information coming out, which is. Um, stopped an array from uh, having to be a, a, an issue for the scatter node um, and then coming out of there we've got a little apply transform node with its various little um, time options and then that comes out into the instances as points and then we've got our two characters there and we could do the same with vehicles as well and we you know the, the great thing about um, Bifrost is, as I said, it's non-destructive and you can start to create your own tools as well. Um, so, for instance, if I put all of this together, um, we can start to break things down so they make more sense to us. There's a few ways of doing it and it depends on the kind of scene that you want to create. But I can left click here and drag a selection and then I can right click and say create backdrop. And that's just kind of like section. If you've used Houdini or looked at Houdini, or uh, any other uh, program like that, that you, that you can organise things into these backdrops, and it just makes things um, a little easier to read. Um, so we can change colours of backdrops. So I could just double click here, um, change it to some horrible colour, and also in the top left-hand corner, if I double click there, I can start typing. Um, a note to myself or someone else that might want to use this. Use this for instance. Um, randomization or something like that. Um, and then click out of it. And we can continue to do that just, just to make things like a little bit easier for ourselves to understand the next time we come in here. So here we could... Um, yeah, we, we could put a box around these guys and just right click and, and create a backdrop for those as well. Um, and you can start to see how things start to look a little bit a little bit more readable and manageable. Now there, there's another way that we can do things which can make it even easier for the next time that you actually want to um, use this scene. 
and that's to do a thing called create a compound. It basically enables you to group a bunch of objects into a more simplified object that you can use later on. So let's do it with this one because this is the one that's got the most kind of amount of annoying little nodes hanging out of it. If I select all of those and I right click and I go to create compound, we can see that it's now zipped it into one compound. However, we have lost some of the attributes that we were looking to control. Um, but they are all still in here. I can right click and I can go to explode and they will come back. Um, and then we could um, compound it up again. So just right click by the side of it and create compound. And another way of viewing everything that's in here is to double click the compound itself. And then it takes us down a level into that compound where we can see um, all of the information that we saw before. Now this is quite interesting because we can see that we've got an input and an output, much like when we first started Bifrost up. And with that being the case, we can start to take attributes from here back into the input and the output so that this guy has uh, some attributes showing up on it. So let's go back into our compound and just quickly do that. Let's say uh, we're trying to find some of the most important information and parameters that we want to use on this node for, for the future. So I believe the first thing I want to do is um, I want to take this time multiplication out. So I'm just going to click and drag that back out to this input. Now if we go back and look at that compound, we can see that, that value now shows up here and in the parameters we've got a number here and we can use that. I can turn that to 12, right click and everything's going a lot faster. So going back in there, we can see, well, actually, maybe I want to take out the Y value and the Z value, and I want to take out scale, and I want to take out rotate, uh, because at some point I think I'm going to need those. And when we come back out, we can see that they are all now exposed on that compound, um, and the values are all here. So this is really cool, because we can name this now, and we can call it um, my point translate my point translate and the beauty of this is we can do something called publishing this so if you was to save your scene and reopen it this would still be here but if you want to be able to uh, be in a different scene and be able to use this we have to publish it so if I right click I can go to publish my point translate if I click that this is now looking into my Bifrost Compounds folder, which is within my Autodesk Bifrost Compounds um, um, tree um, directory, and that's where all of the compounds for Bifrost exist. So if you ever download uh, a compound from the area or anywhere else um, on Autodesk or on the uh, Bifrost Discord, um, you can drop them into the compounds folder, restart my and you can use them much like any plugin or script. So now we're going to create, uh, hit publish and I can actually delete this now. Um, and I can hit the tab key and I can type in my, and there we go straight away. It comes up my point translate and we can see that now we could just undo this, plug that in there and plug that in there. And we've got just one node. And that is the beauty of Biofrost, and, and that's what um, is really important to understand, is that we only ever really have to do uh, a complex task once. Um, and you'll probably find on many occasions that someone else has done that complex task for you, and you can just use their compounds. Um, and we can do the same with any amount of compounds, apart from objects. We can't compound those because they don't exist. But I could say, I could get a, an instance, the randomization, the uh, randomized point scale, and I could right click and I could create a compound out of that. And I could go into that and start to pull out various attributes back to um, the main compound. And then I know that I've got my own type of instance. I, I could call it instance with random rotation. So I'd never have to do that again. Um, and that is the joy of Bifrost. It's, so you can see it's very, very powerful. It can get complex. Um, 
the deeper you go into it. But we've, you know, not spent too much time and we've created a um, interesting graph which is usable in uh, real life. Um, and we've seen how we can streamline Bifrost to work for us in the future. So let me just get rid of this backdrop for a second. Something to note um, is that if we need to shade our characters, at the moment they've just got default shaders on them, um, between here and here is where we would want to add our shader um, attributes. So in Bifrost you do that by assigning a material. So I can hit tab and just start typing assign. And we go to assign material. And we need to assign something to it. Now we can drag and drop material um, shaders, Arnold shaders, from the hypershade. We could just drag them in there. Um, and with instances, we can use file nodes that are attached to them. As long as they're not, it's not like a very uh, complex shader. You have to understand that Bifrost is still in beta mode at the moment. Um, and uh, file nodes aren't um, like the best thing in it at the moment. Um, but it's, you know, they'll soon be here. But we can add um, textures to instances. But for now, I'm just going to add in an Arnold shader within Bifrost. So if I hit the tab key, I can start to type standard as in standard uh, surface material from Arnold. And click there. And this is an Arnold standard surface material. The only difference is we don't have the um, presets that we get within the Hypershade on the Arnold material. And so we would get a material and we would drag that in, we'd drag standard surface into surface. If we was using a volume material, we would drag it into volume, uh, etc. So we can then take our guy out and plug that in there and plug that back in here. Um, and we could go to the standard surface material and within uh, Bifrost itself, we can add a color to it. So let's just add some kind of color. Uh, that is that. And, and what is important to note is that if the material doesn't change color, sometimes you just need to unplug and plug back in, um, in the output and the color will show up. Um, and we can then do the same for the next one. But this time we could um, we could just select this one and select this one, just say Control C, Control V. Um, and it's, it's also grab the input, we'll just get rid of that and we'll plug this one into here as well. And plug that into the instances. And on this material, we'll just make it blue or something like that, just so we can see the difference. And we can see now that hasn't actually updated, but if we just pull this out and, and put it back in again, uh, or pull it out and put it back in here again. It'll update. It's just um, it's just a small bug, and nothing to worry about. And so that is about it. Um, we've created what looks like a fairly complex graph, but believe me, they get a lot more complex. Um, but this was just like a fairly simple look at instancing. Obviously, we can use instancing with trees and leaves and grass and lakes and um, we don't just have to instance on uh, these kinds of surfaces we could instance on curves um, I could just quickly show you how to do that actually so if we were just to go to create curve tools CV curve tool and we'll just click and drag and create a curve we get the outliner I can just pull this curve into here and instead of using the scatter uh, for the instance, we'll um, just unplug that for a moment. Um, no, I think I've unplugged the wrong thing there. Hang on. No, I haven't. No, no, that's the, that's the right thing. So let's just plug this curve in instead. And we can see that these guys are now scattering along the curve. Now with curves in Bifrost, um, we can actually change the segment multiplication or the length um, and so we could like scroll down inside there and then what's really handy about it is we can actually still grab those uh, verts those CVs and move it around and um, uh, the instances will move with it and it's kind of handy for creating things like chains and obviously 
Within um, Bifrost, we could add dynamics to um, these kind of things, which is a lot more um, complicated, but very, very doable. And so if we want, we could have many versions of these. Uh, we could just, you know, select all of those and we can say Control C, Control V, and then we'll just create like a whole another load of them. Sorry, Control V. Up here and uh, we could go in and then say, well, actually, yes, we want the uh, curve to be, um, uh, you know, have some people on it, but we want those street signs to also have some people on it. Um, and it can get a bit messy, but we could probably just put these in a, in a separate graph just to simplify things out. But it, I could just grab all of these guys down here and uh, bring these up here and then just re-plug in those to there and then where's our instance gone there's the instance and then we can just open up uh, put down a new output and I could just drag those output into there and we get our guys on the street again at the moment they haven't got a scatter node attached to them but it's easy to just uh, grab that and put that on and let's just do that So now we're scattering and we're using the curve as well. And we would then just go and neat and tidy all of this up because it's very messy at the moment. <laughs> um, so yeah, that is um, instancing in Bifrost. It's an introduction to Bifrost. There's a lot more to go over. Um, I'll be doing a second video on this and um, uh, hopefully you can join in. I'll make this scene available and um, we can uh, start exploring some more of Bifrost. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a very powerful tool. And um, have fun. Take care. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Bill. That was amazing. And I hope that's given you a brief insight into Bifrost and how powerful it can be. And we've only just scratched the surface. Now, Phil is going to be back for a part two where we're going to go a bit further and do some sort of VFX with Bifrost, maybe a power-up or something. And if you want to learn much more about Bifrost, go into deeper, check out his channel at MayaGuy. I'll leave the link in the description and also his amazing art over on his website at MayaGuy.com. Now, you can use any geometry you want, any files you want, any Alembic cache animation to do this lesson. But if you want my actual walk cycle and the jog circle I used in this lesson and the Maya project file, then head over to the Patreon page where you can join and support the channel and get this file and many other files from After Effects files and also hopefully join a VIP Discord channel where you can get advice and feedback from me. So once again, thanks so much for watching. Leave a comment, tell your friends and I'll see you in the next one.